All right, this morning's sermon, I want to teach on the subject of, of little g gods in the Bible. And there's a verse that we're going to get to by the very end of the sermon that, in my opinion, it's a, it's a more difficult passage to understand. I think a lot of people can have problems with the verses where Jesus said, Is it not written, you know, in your law that I have said, ye are gods? And, you know, basically the, you know, people were persecuting him because he said, I'm the son of God. So I'm going to get into that a little bit. And there's also a lot of false teaching about this going on out there by very big name, you know, TV preachers and things like that. So I want to kind of cover the subject. But we're going to start with just, I just want to prove to you and show you that having the little G God title or, or name or whatever applied to you is not a good thing. It's never a good thing to, to be called like a God because gods are always referred to as devils or as idols, as, as things that are not, not good, not something that you want to be associated with. So uh, let's start off here in Isaiah chapter 44. First of all, because we know there is only one true God. So even though there are, we know that there are things or, or uh, you know, idols that are called gods, there's religions that, that may worship multiple gods or have a different god. At the end of the day, there still is only one god, regardless of what anybody believes or thinks or how many religions are out there. There is one god. There's one true god. And we see that here in Isaiah chapter 44, look at verse number 6, and, and in many other places. But right here is just one example. Thus saith the Lord, the God of the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Amen. So right off the bat, God is saying there is no God but me. And that's an important statement to understand, because if we're going to start applying God to actually be legitimate, as in, you know, because what, what, what one of the teachings is, I'll get into this soon, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but just starting off with this real basic fact. When, when God says, beside me, there is no God. You can't go applying, you know, believers or anybody as just being like real gods, as being legitimate gods, because God said there is no God beside me. There is only one God. And that's him. Now, we have things that are called God, but they're not Gods, they're not God. They're just, they just have that term applied to them because of what they're trying to be. Let's keep reading here. Verse number seven, the Bible says, And who as I shall call and shall declare it and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come, let them show unto them. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time and have declared it, ye are my, even my witnesses, is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. So again, it's just being reiterated. God just, like, I don't know of any other gods. Okay, if God doesn't know of any other gods, there's no other gods. Then there isn't any. Verse 9. And, and by the way, you know, this is a perfect place to show the Jehovah's Witnesses because in their, when, when you try to show them the deity of Christ, one of my favorite passages to show that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh is John 1.1, 1, 1, where the Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That shows that it, it, it really demonstrates the Trinity, or one, the, the aspect of the Trinity with Jesus and the Father, that he is with God and he was God at the same time. So simultaneously being with God and being God, same time, amazing verse. But in the New World Translation, which is the translation of the Bible that the Jehovah's Witnesses use, their book says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was a God. It says it was a God. That, that one little letter just added completely changes the entire meaning of that verse. So here's where you expose, one, their false version of the Bible, and two, their false belief to them. I like showing this to people. Now, they don't always accept it or want to accept it, but if I'm going to talk to them, I like to at least show, hey, this isn't it, because it's very clear. There's no real wiggle room when it comes to, if that says Jesus was a God, but he's not, 
God, then you have a contradiction when you go to Isaiah 44 and the Father is saying, beside me there is no God. I, I don't know of any other God. Well, then how can the Word be a God if the Father doesn't know of any other God? There is no other God. Very powerful. And obviously very important what book we read, and, and we're King James only uh, church here, but um, look at what it says here in the next verse, verse number 10. Or excuse me, maybe we're on verse number 9. Verse number 9, They that make a graven image are all of them vanity, and their delectable things shall not profit, and they are their own witnesses. They see not nor know that they may be ashamed. Look at verse 10. Who hath formed a God or molten a graven image that is profitable for nothing? So now this is talking about things that are called gods. You have many religions throughout history and even today where people will create some image and bow down to and pray to and worship something that literally was made with men's hands carved out of wood, graven in gold, graven in silver, and, and, and they call these things holy you know, gods or holy artifacts, and they'll put them up on a pedestal, and they'll light candles around them, and they'll build sanctuaries and altars before an image. And what God is doing here in his word is showing how utterly absurd such a concept really is. To take God, the one true God, in all of his glory, in all of his power, and everything that he is, and reduce that to an object is absolutely ridiculous. And he's saying, who, how can you form a God? How can that even be called a God if you can form it with your hands? If you are creating a God, that is no God. Verse 11, Behold, all his fellows shall be ashamed, and the workmen they are of men. Let them all be gathered together. Let them stand up. Yet they shall fear, and they shall be ashamed together. The smith with the tongs both worketh in the coals, and fashioneth it with hammers, and worketh it with the strength of his arms. Yea, he is hungry, and his strength faileth. He drinketh no water, and is faint. The carpenter stretcheth out his rule. He marketh it out with a line. He fitteth it with planes, and he marketh it out with a compass and maketh it after the figure of a man according to the beauty of a man that it may remain in the house. And he's, so he's talking about this blacksmith and a carpenter and they're you know, getting all the tools out and forming and fashioning it and just describing how these guys are just creating these objects that are going to stay in a house and be called a god or worshipped as a god. Verse 14, He heweth him down cedars and taketh the cypress and the oak, which he strengtheneth for himself among the trees of the forest. He planteth an ash, and the rain doth nourish it. Then shall it be for a man to burn, for he will take thereof and warm himself. Yea, he kindleth it and baketh bread. Yea, he maketh a god and worshipeth it. He maketh it a graven image and falleth down there too. So basically he's saying the same wood, the cypress and the oak that men are, they're chopping down, they're burning fires and cooking their food with it and just using it as you normally would. That same exact wood, the same exact material, people are taking that and going, oh, I'm making a god and I'm going to bow down and worship this thing that you were just using to cook your food with. And that's just turning to ashes. It, it is completely ridiculous. Verse, let's keep reading here. It says, um, verse 16, He burneth part thereof in the fire. With part thereof he eateth flesh. He roasteth flesh and is satisfied. Yea, he warmeth himself and saith, Aha, I am warm. I have seen the fire. And the residue thereof he maketh a god. Even his graven image. He falleth down unto it and worshipeth it and prayeth unto it and saith, Deliver me for thou art my god. Over and over again, we're going to see God being a label to, a reference to things that aren't God, but that's because people have made them gods to themselves. In their mind, they've imagined this and they've come up and they've created their own God in whatever image they'd like to do it because they make it. You create your own, have it your way, right? It's the Burger King God. You just build your own. 
You want a side of fries with that? You can get the side of fries. You just carve that up too. I mean, you want a drink? No drink. Diet drink. Just create your own God. But that's not, that's not the real God. It's a little G God. And the Bible is consistent with that. These little G gods are not God. They're not like, it's not like in Roman or Greek mythology where you have a whole multitude of gods and they're all in their, their heavenly kingdom, whatever, having discussions and fighting with each other and, and whatever. That's, that's not reality. Those are all just fictitious, made-up things that are called God. Verse 18, they have not known nor understood, for he hath shut their eyes that they cannot see in their hearts that they cannot understand. This is God talking, this is talking about God shutting the eyes of people who have gone down this road of idolatry and closing their hearts that they can't understand and basically blinding them and making them reprobate. And again, when you look in Romans chapter 1, the Bible says, for this cause God gave them over unto reprobate mind. And, and it's starts off with their idolatry and with their coming to just creating their own gods in their own mind. Uh, verse number 19, And none considereth it in his heart, neither is there knowledge nor understanding to say, I have burned part of it in the fire, yea, also I have baked bread upon the coals thereof. I have roasted flesh and eaten it, and shall I make the residue thereof an abomination? Shall I fall down to the stock of a tree? So the reason why people can even continue in this, I think, or part of the reason I don't believe every single person is a reprobate who's ever done any, you know, worshiped some false god before. But when it boils down to it, there's just no understanding given there at all of like what, what the object literally is. It's, it's ridiculous. So there's one example. There's a lot of examples like this in scripture. Um, I'm not even going to turn to some of the ones I have listed here because I have a lot of notes. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 does a good job of explaining just why we even use the word gods, why that term is used in Scripture. We kind of got an idea for it already. I have in my notes Deuteronomy 32, but it's basically saying the same thing Isaiah 44 says. You can look at Isaiah 43, 44, 45, and in all of those, God's saying, you know, I am God and there is none beside me. Same statements just kind of being reiterated over and over again. Deuteronomy 32 says, you know, where are their gods, their rock in whom they trusted? It says, see now that I, even I am he, and there is no God with me. Just, you see this re repeated multiple times in Scripture. There is one God, okay? I don't think I have to convince you all of that here this morning. Pretty basic stuff. But look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse number 4. The Bible says, As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols. Now, instead of using the word gods here, you're saying idols. Because that's really what an idol is. It's just a false god. It's another, you know, it's a, an idol is something that people create to be a god, to be worshipped as god. Idols, gods can ultimately be used, I would say, interchangeably. We know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one. And we see it interchanged right there. He says, we know that an idol is nothing. So the idol itself is nothing. It's wood. It's gold. It's whatever. It's these physical properties. It really is nothing just in and of itself. And that there is none other God but one. There's only one God. We know this. So look at verse number five. It says, For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there be gods many and lords many, that phrase in parentheses, it's not saying that they're really deity. It's just saying that there's people out there calling God. There's, yeah, there's many gods out there. There's Zeus, there's Thor, but they're not real. <laughs> they're just establishing the fact they're not real, but there are many gods out there. And see, a verse like this is a verse that the, that the cult religions will want to turn to and say, well, yes, yeah, there are gods many. Oh. Like the Mormons who believe in multiple gods. There's gods of other planets, and if you're a good enough Mormon, you'll be a god of your own planet. And, you know, who knows how many gods there are out there. They like verses like this and just completely take it out of context, which the context is very simple. You just read the verse before. It's going to tell you, look, there's one god. There are that are called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God. 
the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Now, I also want to make note of this or point this out because this is going to be important for the teaching this morning. In this verse that we just read, in verse number five, in the parentheses, it says, as there be God's many and Lord's many. I just want to point out that, that it's, it's referencing their lords as like rulers or people who are in charge, okay? Princes, rulers, because we're going to see that they also will get ascribed this label of being a god. That it's not just the actual physical idol, but people are refer getting this label of being gods as well in, that, in, in certain positions. So let's turn to chapter 10 now. You're in 1 Corinthians 8. Just flip over to chapter 10. <coughs> The Bible gives us further explanation on these idols, on these little gods that are created, that men have created, that they're actually devils. That it's, there's more to it even than just them being some inanimate object. They're actually worshiping devils when you're worshiping an idol. Verse number 19 there in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the Bible says, What say I then, that the idol is anything or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. So a lot of this idolatry, I believe this idolatry comes from devils influencing people to create this idolatry. Just like Satan, it's one of Satan's goals. I don't know how far we're going to get into that. Today, we've got some passages on Satan as well. Satan wants to be like the Most High. That's it. He wants to be God. He wants to be like God. He wants people to worship him. And the devils, plural, other devils out there, other fallen angels, they want the same thing. So I don't think it's a big surprise that you hear about these false religions in, in, you know, in Mormonism with Joseph Smith and in Islam with you know, the so-called prophet Muhammad being met by you know, angels. Or at least that's what they think. They say, oh, I've been met by some angel. Yeah, it was a fallen angel. It was a devil that was talking to them and they create these religions and then they create this idolatry and they create all this stuff so that they can receive this worship. They're worshiping devils. Being deceived by devils. And yes, the actual objects that they make, whatever the idol is, that is nothing because it still is just a physical substance. But what they're doing in effect is worshiping a devil. Because it's not God. <laughs> you're, you're not worshiping God. You're worshiping a devil. And that's what we see here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Um, but there is an allure to this. Genesis chapter 3, if you want to turn there, Genesis chapter 3. Satan uses the deception of wanting to be a God with Eve in the Garden of Eden. This is one of the temptations. And there is an allure to wanting to be a god. This, there's an allure to it for, you know, the Mormons. I want to be a god. And that's, that was Satan's downfall. Satan wants to be like the Most High. He wasn't satisfied where he was. He wasn't content. He wanted to be a god. He wanted to be the god. In Genesis chapter 3, we're going to start reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So right there, this is, this is when there are no other people. It's Adam and Eve in the garden with Satan, with the serpent. And he's saying, you're going to be like gods. Because they're referencing God. Well, God said this. And he said, well, you're not surely going to die because then you're going to be like gods. 
And there's an allure to that, like, oh, I'm going to be like God if I eat of this tree. It's going to make me be like him. And this is exactly why I believe, you know, the, the Mormon religion is purely satanic. It is purely of Satan. This is exactly what Satan's trying to say. Hey, you could be as gods. What does Mormon teach? You can be a god. That's Satan's pitch. If that doesn't give it away, I don't know what will. You should be as God. And, and that's also why in their teaching, it very subtly shows that Satan really wasn't that bad of a guy. He's, he's the brother of Jesus Christ. He, he's just had a different plan for humanity than Jesus had. And, but he was a God. So, yeah, they'll say that he was, you know, he's a bad guy, or whatever, but like in their teaching, he really isn't that bad. He just didn't get chosen to be the God of the planet Earth. That Jesus' way was chosen. And it's, it's, it's ridiculous, but this is literally what their doctrine teaches. And if you talk to them, a lot of times they'll try to deny that. Oftentimes they, they don't want to be, they don't really want it known what all their core beliefs are. But if you talk to them long enough, you press them, they will admit to it. I've had them admit to it. They'll, they'll say, yes, that's true. And it is true, and you can find it in, in their teaching. It just takes a little bit of digging. Um, this is dangerous. Ye shall be as gods. This teaching that you can be a god is dangerous and it's satanic. Teaching that any person can be a god is not right. It's of the devil. And we have people like Joyce Meyer and Kenneth Copeland and Benny Hinn and Creflo Dollar all preaching this junk that says that you can be, you are gods. That if you're a believer, you're a god. And, and I checked this out for myself. I heard from Brother Peter. I didn't know that they taught this doctrine. I didn't even know this. I mean, I know those people are wicked, but I haven't spent very much time listening to them. And when he said that, I was just like, you know, I looked it up for myself and I heard, yep, exactly out of their mouth. And it's funny. It says that they teach that believers can be little G gods. So you can be little G. Well, you're, we're not saying that you're God, but you'd be a little G God. Well, I don't want to be a little G God. Because every time you see that, and do your own Bible study, obviously I'm not getting to all the references of, of little G gods in the Bible. I am going to deal with the one that people, I think, get a little bit confused about because of the way it's written and because of the way Jesus said it. Just as there are a few other statements that Jesus has made that might leave you scratching your head a little bit because he was speaking to people, one, that weren't even saved and he wasn't expounding full truth to them. He was giving them what he wanted to give them for his purposes to tell them, you know, to make the statement he was making. But it, we'll, get it, we'll get in that. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself again. But these people teach that believers can be little G gods. And one of the, they use the same exact arguments. So one of, the, one of the things I like to use most is, well, you're made in the image of God. Yeah, in the image Okay, God looks a certain way. We are an image. That doesn't mean he created gods. We're made in the image of God. But here's how they spin it, and it's really stupid, but they get people going with this. Because they'll, they'll go to Genesis. So they'll see in Genesis chapter 1, everything brings forth after its kind, right? Sheep bring forth after a sheep kind, and dogs bring forth after dog kind, and cat bring forth after a cat kind. But you know what God did? God made man. So if God is bringing forth, what's he bringing forth? He's bringing forth after his kind. So if, if dogs bring forth dogs and cats bring forth cats, what does God bring forth? They say gods. And if you didn't already realize how stupid that is, God made all the animals too. So does that mean that the cow and the dog are gods? Because that's the same logic. Just because God initially created Everything doesn't make them God. It's not like God brought forth after his own kind. Hey, this dog is now God. This cat is now God. This cow is now God. That blade of grass is now God. Why? Because God created it? That's stupidity. But this is what the false teachers do. They excel at that. They try to make it sound like it makes sense. 
Because they'll go through that whole long list. Well, dogs bring forth their gods. And what does God bring forth after? And everyone's going, gods. Oh, we're gods. No. 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 Heresy. Blasphemy. But that's what they'll do. Um, yeah, Creflo Dollar was one, like he literally was saying, you are gods, little g. And they get that teaching. Turn to Psalm 82. Because this is what they really like to use to, to explain that. Psalm 82 is the passage that Jesus quotes in the New Testament. When, when they're condemning Jesus Christ for, for claiming to be the Son of God, he quotes Psalm 82 to basically show their hypocrisy and just show, you know, and to stump them. That's what he's doing. He's tripping them up in their own weird way of thinking anyways, because these guys hated Jesus. They were Jesus rejectors. These are the Pharisees. And he's answering them so that they can't answer him back. It's the purpose of him saying what he says. Psalm 82, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. So right off the bat, God stands among the, the congregation of the mighty. So the gathering, whatever, there's, there's mighty people. And typically it's the mighty people who are the rulers and in charge, right? They're, the, they're considered the mighty ones. And God stands among the mighty. It says he judgeth among the gods. And we're going to see this, this term associated, you know, gods with these mighty people, these rulers. Okay? Verse 2. How long will ye judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Selah. So now he's talking about, un, you know, unjust judging. Someone who's in authority, someone who's ruling is a judge. I mean, every ruler is a judge in a sense. And he's talking to these people, he said, among the gods, right? These people who are lifted up in themselves and have gotten real proud from their power and from their position to where they're thinking they're like gods and they have this authority to do. I mean, in many cases, rulers have authority that's, that's you know, just below God. They're, they're like these little gods on this earth you get to live, you get to die, right? By the command of a ruler. And, and they get that type of a power and a power trip. And even to a certain degree, anyone who gets put into these positions of authority can, can get on this God complex type of power trips. You see that even with, you know, with cops sometimes. They just get so used to, to being able to tell people what to do and you know, you do this and you do that. And, you know, and, they, and they start thinking of themselves as just being these superior beings to everyone else. And you better listen to what I say. It happens to, to rulers, to you know, anyone who gets put into certain positions of authority. It goes to their heads. Um, and here he's talking about people now that they're judging unjustly. He says, defend the poor and fatherless in verse 3. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand they walk on in darkness. This is talking about those gods that he's ruling among. Because first he's saying, how long will you judge unjustly? And then he tells them, this is what you need to do. You need to, to do right by the poor and fathers. You need to deliver the poor and needy. And then it says, he says in verse 5, they know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. Notice Again, there's that, co that correlation between gods and judging and these princes and rulers, great men of power. The Bible explains to us that Satan is the god of this world. There is a power that Satan has in this world. In, uh, and you don't have to turn it, but in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the Bible says, In whom the god of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So he's referred to... now. We already established, God already established, there is no God but him. But at the same time, Satan is being referred to as the God of this world. Okay. Um, we also see in Exodus 20, you don't, you don't have to turn this place, stay there, be in Psalm 82 because we're not done there yet. 
Exodus 22, verse 28 says, Thou shalt not revile the gods, nor curse the ruler of thy people. So again, there's this correlation with gods being reviled and um, the ru you know, a ruler. And then in Jude, verse 9, the Bible says, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. And the reason why I bring that up is that, you know, Exodus 22, 28 says, Thou shalt not revile the God. Satan's known as the God of this world. And when Michael the archangel is contending with the devil, he said he didn't bring against him a railing accusation. He wasn't reviling Satan, even. Um, and the reason why I think this is interesting is because you've got the, you know, the people I already mentioned, the, the Kenneth Copelands and the, you know, the Joyce Myers, these people have a tendency to be like these, these charismatic type preachers. And these are going to be the same, the same teachers, the same preachers that teach that you could be little gods. They're also the same ones that like to bring up the railing accusations and shouting at the devil and just, you know, all of this big talk about the devil. Oh, you get out of here, devil. I'm going to fight you, devil. And, you know, like, like just, just bringing on this extreme language of like, you know, going after the devil. Where we don't even see Michael the archangel doing that. And we don't see that as being appropriate for us to be doing, going after the, you know, we're, we're told to withstand the devil. We're, we're told to get on the armor of God and get the shield and get the helmet, and get, you know, and having done all to stand. You know, we need to quench the fiery darts of the devil. We don't need to just be taking on Satan. We've got our own job to do. Ultimately, yes, there's a spiritual battle going on, but we're supposed to just worry about doing what's right. We're not going to destroy Satan. God will do that. God's got plans in store for Satan. God can deal with him. That's why Michael the Archangel said, the Lord rebuke thee. Back in Psalm 82, look at verse number 6, the Bible says, I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, but ye shall die like men. And fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. I think this, pas this makes the passage clear. That it's talking about men that are lifted up into thinking they're gods. Because right when he says, I have said ye are gods, he's still not meaning they're real gods. Right. <laughs> yes, you're gods. But you're going to be brought down like men. The reason why he's even saying ye are gods is because in their minds, they're lifted up as these rulers, as, the power, as being gods. And he's saying, but you're going to be brought down and you're going to die like a man. Because a god, I mean, how you can you kill a god? Like a real god. No one can kill God. But a man, they die. They get brought down. And no matter how lifted up someone might, how crazy, and some people get really crazy in their own mind. They think they're just never going to die. Yeah. And they just go nuts down this path. They've gotten so blinded and, and so lifted up in themselves that they literally, people out there literally think that they're going to cheat death somehow and they're, they're not going to die or whatever. And they're going to continue on. They're going to be brought down. Everyone gets done. I don't want to be... What the Bible is referring to here as where he said, I have said ye are gods. Because in the next verse, he says, but you're going to die like a man and you're going to be brought down. Like, no, nope, I don't want that to be me. I'm not going to apply that to believers. I'm not going to apply that to anyone saying ye are gods. Because that is not the good, a good thing to be. He says, you're going to fall like one of the princes. And again, a prince is like a king, a ruler. Think of principal, someone who's, who's primary in, in a position of authority. Um, Turn to Ezekiel 28. We're doing pretty good on time here. We'll, we're going to end up and we're going to close ultimately with John chapter 10 where he quotes Psalm 82. But I just want to bring this up real quick here. Going further into the concept of these rulers being called gods. We saw how the idols are called gods. That's very clear. Now we're going to see some of the application towards 
you know, like Satan being in, a th in somewhat of, of a position of power, because uh, he does have power. And in Ezekiel 28, we're going to see, we see earlier, I think it's Ezekiel 27, where um, the king of Tyre is, is being preached to, being preached against, and being uh, told what's going to happen. But then in chapter 28, where we're going to read, this is referring, I believe, more directly to Satan. Yeah, in, in, in chapter 27, it starts off, The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Now thou son of man, take up a lamentation for Tyrus. And say unto Tyrus, O thou that are situate in the, tree, in the sea. Uh, and it's talking about the, the city of Tyrus and, and this land. And then in chapter 28, it says, The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus. So the prince is the ruler, right? The ruler of Tyrus. Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am go a God. I am a God. I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. This is the exact same thing that Psalm 82 is talking about. This prince, this judge, who's not judging righteously, who's not, you know, uh, pleading for the fatherless and widows and everything that it's said that they're supposed to do. In his heart, he says, I'm a God. Yet thou art a man and not God. And guess what's going to happen? He's going to be destroyed. He's going to die as a man because he's not a God. Verse number three. But now we see I, where I think this is referring to Satan. Verse number three, Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. With thy wisdom and with thine understanding, thou hast gotten thee riches and hast gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. But thy great wisdom, by thy great wisdom and by thy traffic, hast thou increased thy riches and thine heart is lifted up because of thy riches. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God, behold, Therefore, I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom, and they shall devile thy brightness. They shall bring thee down to the pit, and thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. Wilt thou yet say before him that slayeth thee, I am God? I love that statement. He's saying, so when the people actually come to kill you, and they're just about to strike you through and kill you, are you going to say, but I'm a God? <laughs> no. It's not going to do you any good, but thou shalt be a man and no God in the hand of him that slayeth thee. So you're just a man. You're not God. You are not a God. You are no God. Thou shalt die the deaths of the uncircumcised by the hand of the strangers, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. So there's an example of someone who's lifted up in themselves being referred to as a God because they think they're a God. And we know that there are devils that are in positions of, of high authority and power that are influencing people that are in those positions as well. So the human instruments are being influenced by devils behind the scenes at the, at the high levels of power in this world. And that's, that's what we wrestle against, not flesh and blood, blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And uh, that is going to, I proved that in other sermons. I'm not going to get too deep, deep into that this morning. A uh, couple more places. Isaiah 14, and then we're going to go to John chapter 10. Isaiah chapter 14. We're just going to see one more example of this. The reason why I'm going to so many of these places, even though some of them might seem redundant, is just because I want to drive home all throughout Scripture how much the Bible is, is showing that you know, being a God or being referred to as a God or being called gods, it's not a positive thing ever. It's not a good thing, no matter how you define it, okay? Whether you call it an idol or you know, a devil, uh, you know, a ruler, wh whatever it is that you want to ascribe to what the Bible is talking about when it's talking about these lowercase g gods, it's never a positive thing. It's never a good thing. 
So I'm never going to call another believer and say, well, you're a God too. Because we're not. We are not. We are men. We are not gods. Look at Isaiah chapter 14, verse number 6. The Bible says, He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he that ruled the nations in anger is persecuted and none hindereth. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee and the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since thou art laid down, no feller has come up against us. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. And they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? So this is talking about um, Satan, because we're going to get into that just a minute. We're going to call him Lucifer. He's done all of this damage. We started reading verse number six. He smote the people in wrath. He ruled the nations in anger. He persecuted and no one stopped him, right? He's, he's bringing forth all this destruction and has all this power, right? And people are looking at him like a god because he has all this power and he's doing all this stuff. And then it says, oh, when he's cast down, you, you're just like us? You've just become, are you weak like us? Verse 11, thy pomp is brought down to the grave and the noise of thy vials, the worm is spread under the tree, or excuse me, under thee, and the worms cover thee. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. That's his attitude. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. Every time these little G-gods are being brought up about being lifted up, they're always being brought down. You say, well, no, actually, you're going to be brought down to hell. You think you're so high and mighty. You want to be like me. You want to be like God, right? Is God speaking, of course. Well, I'm going to bring you down to hell. Verse 16, that they... They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble? That did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners? Is This is him? So when Satan's finally cast out, they're going to be like, that's, that's who made everybody afraid? That's who did all this damage? It's just, it's just him? God has a way of making, making everything right. So those that lift themselves up, they're going to be brought down. Those that are brought down real low, God can lift up and exalt. So his people that are going out and doing the work of the Lord and getting beaten down and getting persecuted and getting spit on and, and just having all manner of evil set against them falsely, God's going to lift them up. And these people who are doing who think they're gods in their own mind and want to go and do all this evil and wickedness and, and judge unrighteously, God's going to bring them down. They're not gods. Now let's go to John chapter 10, verse 31. We'll close on this. John chapter 10, we're picking up a story. The Jews want to kill Jesus because, because he is who he claims he is, because he's the son of God. But he's making these claims. They think he's blaspheming. Um, verse number 31 is where we'll start reading in John chapter 10. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. So when Jesus said he's the Son of God, he was making himself God. Now, 
That is true. Because Jesus being the Son of God, even in the, in the strictest sense of, of Him being born into the world of the Virgin Mary with the Holy Spirit conceiving seed, God does bring forth after His own kind, if you want to look at it that way, because He was, you know, yes, man being born of the Virgin, but God in the sense that He literally was conceived of God and came forth, that He is God. And they recognize that, and that is a truth. And uh, that's why they wanted to, to, to kill him. But now Jesus answers him, answers them, because they, they, <laughs> they're about to kill him, first of all. Jesus is not, his time has not yet come at this point either. There's been many times, and you can see this in the ministry of Jesus Christ, where he uses very, very wise answers to get himself out of situations without, I mean, he's not lying, he's not being dishonest, he's not doing any of that, but he's able to put things back on the people who are coming at him, right? So uh, when people ask him, is it lawful to pay tribute unto Caesar? They're trying to, they're, they're constantly trying to get him in these catch-22s where he, there's not going to be a right answer. And what we, the way that we see him answer is always very wise. You say, well, whose image and superscription is that? Right? Well, it's Caesar's. Well, render therefore unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, and render unto God that which is God. So that way he's not taking from God or from Caesar in his answer. He's just saying, well, whatever it belongs to, that's who, that's who you give it to. Without just saying, like, no, you don't have to pay, you know, whatever. Because remember, when we talked to Peter, when they were trying to get um, custom of them or tribute, and he's saying, well, you know, what does the law even say? Are we, is it of the children or of strangers? Like, well, of strangers, they're the ones who are supposed to pay the tax. So then, then are the children free? He says, but so we don't offend them, just go ahead, you know, go catch his fish or go find money in there and just pay it to him. But he tells him, basically, we don't, we don't have to pay that. But when the people come that are trying to, you know, put him into jail, well, should we render unto Caesar or not? He's saying, well, just give. Give unto Caesar after Caesar, give unto God after his God. Same thing with, um, you know, the woman, at, or the woman taken in adultery, right? They're trying to get him to go against the Roman government so that the Roman government can then just seize him as someone who's usurping authority. If they say, well, she was taken in adultery, she needs to be put to death, so what do you say? Because if he says, don't put her to death, then he's contradicting the law of Moses. And if he says, put her to death, then he's going to be arrested and, and you know, brought before the Roman government for taking the law in his hands or whatever, right? That's, that's what they were trying to do to him. And again, he answers that very wisely. Well, he says, with, without sin among you, let him, let him first cast a stone at her. Didn't say don't kill her, but he did it, he did it in such a way as to just kind of get them all to realize their own hypocrisy and, and, to, and to leave, and, and he answered wisely. And I think that's exactly what he's doing here. So when, he's, when, he's, when they're saying, like, look, we're, they're ready to kill him. He's not ready to die yet. So he stumps them and he trips them up, even though what they're saying is true. Yes, he's making himself God. Yes, he is. Because he is God in the flesh. That by being the son of God, he is. But what he does then is he turns it around on them. Well, hey, you know, does it, isn't this what your law says? In verse 34, Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law, I said, ye are God's? So he quotes part of the verse and just says that, well, isn't that in the scripture anyways? I say, said, you're gods. If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, say of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest because I said I am the son of God. So they probably don't understand that verse where I said ye are gods. And the people he's speaking to here are the ones that I think are the ones that would think of themselves as gods anyways. These ones in power and authority and these unrighteous judges that are coming to Jesus Christ. And they are the ones who said, I said, ye are gods. But God's going to bring them low, right? So, sure, the Bible says that, yeah, ye are gods. But now you want to... You know, you, you want to condemn me, that whom the Father hath sanctified? He's saying, God, you know, the Father sanctified me and sent into the world, thou blasphemest because I said I am the Son of God. And then he goes on to say, you know, if I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. 
it just don't worry about what I say if, I, if what I'm doing doesn't match up. But if I do, though you believe not me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. And, you know, ultimately, obviously, they don't end up killing him here. But this isn't a passage that's teaching. He's not teaching these people who are coming to kill him. Whoa, you're a believer, so you're a God. That's not what he's saying at all. Because they're not even believers. They're not believing that he's the son of God. But he's saying this to them who it would apply to, just as it did in the verses quoted from in Psalm 82. That it was talking to people who are these rulers, these judges, but in their minds, they're, they're basically got this God complex. Now, the application, so this is, this is a pretty, you know, trying to be more doctrinal or informational on just understanding maybe more of a, a, a hard passage to understand from Scripture is one of the purposes. But I want to close just by giving the warning that believers are still susceptible to pride and being lifted up and to getting this type of an attitude or a complex of just, just getting all full of yourself. And that's one of the reasons why the Bible teaches that a novice shouldn't be a pastor of a church because lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. So just as the devil was lifted up with pride and got this type of an attitude where literally, you know, pride blinds you into not being righteous and not doing what's right when you get full of yourself and thinking that you're this God man. Believers have to look out for that too. Don't allow yourself to get lifted up to some state of Oh, don't you know who I am? Don't you know how much I've read? Don't you know, you know, and just having a pompous attitude. Because when you start to get that type of an attitude, you are going to start perverting just, you're, you're not going to see things right. God's going to blind you and your understanding and you're going to be brought down low. And that's why I think sometimes you'll see who I believe to be, especially like in some of the old IFB churches, People who are saved, people who have done a good work for God in general and you know, have done, won a lot of souls to Christ, have done some good things, but they've gotten too proud to accept correction in some matters and have just gotten really stubborn and stiff-necked and, and are just, just not willing to, to, be, to hear any correction whatsoever. And then you'll start seeing them or hearing them say some really weird things. And I don't think it's necessarily because they're unsaved. I think it's just because God's blinded them to, to bring them down a little bit to where they'll be able to humble themselves and then get right. So it is something that, that we do have to, uh, to look out for. Pride is a serious sin. Si pride, that was Satan's, you know, one of his big downfalls. And uh, pride, I think, is also the reason why people make up their own gods and ultimately end up going into reprobation if they just continue down that path. It's just, they're, they end up being full of themselves. They make a God to suit themselves. And a uh, very, very serious sin. So uh, let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for, um, for your words and for the teachings, dear God. Pray that you please help us to continue to grow and to learn more uh, from your words. I pray that you please help us all to have humble attitudes and spirits and help us always to be willing to um, be able to receive correction in areas where we need to receive correction, Lord, that we can know more and just be um, have, have better understanding and, and do what's right more. Dear Lord, I pray that, that you would just lead us and guide us, lead our church. God, help us this afternoon as we go out to, to preach the gospel to people, that, we'd, that, you would, that you would lead us to people whose hearts have already been worked on or to people who have been prayed for, and that you would work through us to, to get these souls saved. And um, we're, we're here to serve you, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.